Uh, I'm pretty excited about Neo 3 3. So, so this vision that I talked about before, about building like a database, a real database, transactions, durability, persistence, et cetera, but with the new data model has really been our guidepost for since 2007, right, to build the best graph database on the planet. And I think Neo4j 3.3 is the best graph database on the planet today. And we worked really hard on that for, for a decade, right? And we've come really far, but when I talk to customers, I see myself on screen, on stage. This is probably not what's supposed to happen. This is one of those uh, meta re recursive things. Um, but when I talk to my customers, and we, we frequently are out and we see how, how you guys use uh, Neo4j, we see that there's a lot of work left to be done, right? What we see as a huge surprise to absolutely no one is that Neo4j very seldomly is deployed in isolation. We live in an ecosystem, of course. There is a relational database, and you move data in and out from that relational database to Neo4j. There is a data lake and legacy where data warehouse or um, a an, an, an more modern big data Hadoop Spark type environment, right? And move data in inside of, outside of that, et cetera. And so what we've said to ourselves is that, well, so how can we make it even easier for our customers to get started with all this, right? And make it more frictionless to build graph-powered applications. And that has made us think a lot about what's, what's next in graphs. What about the next few years in graphs? What if you could simply get all of these technologies in one cohesive package, right? What if you could start with an amazing database like Neo4j, right, which could do graph transactions in real time, right? But then on top of that, what if you had a very powerful and rich analytics library on top of that, where you can, which comes with a built-in set of graph algorithms, right, could run them at massive scale? And what if you had a set of technologies that made it really easy to move data in and out of your graph system, right? To integrate with your relational database, with your other NoSQL databases maybe, with your data lakes, with your data warehouses. And what if you had rich and, and sophisticated tooling to enable both data scientists and data analysts as well as, as, well as developers to work more powerfully with, with that connected data? And what if you had a toolkit that would allow you to expose this to business end users in a code-free navigation type way that ena enables both visualization and discovery for those users, and a rich and consistent and unified powerful API to all of this, right? This architecture is, this or variants of this, we see in almost all of our customer projects. People build up something like this. And our goal is to take that and put that in one cohesive, well-integrated package and offer that to you end users. And we call this the graph platform. And I believe that this is the future of graph technology. And I'm super excited to tell you a little bit more what we're doing in, in, in this world. I think of it a little bit like the LAMP stack for the web, right? As the web rose to prominence in the 90s, the LAMP stack emerged as kind of the default way, at least the default starting point to use to build web applications. This should be the same level of cohesive, well-integrated package, your one-stop shop for everything connected data, right? We believe that this is the future of graphs and we're gonna be completely focused on building out this in the future. But much like the perfect graph database wasn't available when we got started in 2007, the entire graph platform isn't available today. However, here to give you a little bit of a sneak peek, a sneak preview of the future, and show you a little bit of a demo of this graph platform is none other than my colleague, Ryan Boyd. Ryan, please take the stage. Thank you, Emil. I am going to show you today how the Acme Payment Network, like some of the top payment networks in the world, uses graphs to power their business. Acme Payment Network uses each and every part of the graph platform. They use the data integration tools in order to load data from their legacy relational databases into Neo4j graph database, the core of the graph platform. 
They also use the discovery and analytics tools, sorry, the discovery and visualization tools to explore their graphs to understand what is happening in the network. And they use the analytics, the graph analytics, in order to speed up the determination of fraud and money laundering activity. So I'm going to switch over now to the demo, and I'm going to show you how all of this works together as part of the Neo4j graph platform. So what you see here is the Neo4j desktop. The Neo4j desktop is the control center, the mission control for the graph platform. At the top here, you see a, a number of apps that we've built. Um, we call these graph apps. And some of these graph apps are actually coming from Neo4j, such as the Neo4j browser and the ETL tool. Other of these apps, such as Acme Dash, Acme Viz, and Acme Algo, are actually built by the Acme Payment Network. So first, I'm going to jump in to the Neo4j ETL tool. And the Neo4j ETL tool allows us to bring information in from those relational databases that they store the transaction information in. Um, we go over here, and we can set up a relational database connection just using JDBC. Uh, I've actually already set up this connection, so I'm not going to type all these things in here. but you can use Postgres or MySQL or with the Enterprise Edition, also use Oracle to pull data in. And then you go over here to import data. And we're going to click on that connection that we've set up. And we're going to say start mapping. Now, what this has done is it's connected to our Postgres database in this case. And it has looked at all of the tables in the schema of the database. And mapped those tables into a property graph model. It has used the primary keys and foreign key relationships in order to do this mapping. And we can see here our property graph that was created. So we have an account. I'll try to see if I can make that a little bit bigger for you. We have an account which sends money to other accounts. And we have a person. Now, this relationship between account and person isn't exactly what we want. We actually want the relationship to be owned by. So we're going to modify it over here. And we can see the, the graph on the right-hand side has been updated. So we're going to map the, the account table and the person table in, uh, into nodes. And you can see the, the corresponding relationships. You can also go and modify the different uh, parameters, sorry, the different properties of the nodes and relationships here um, and show how those are going to be mapped. Um, so now I'm going to import my data here. And it takes just a second to import the data from the relational database. And then I'm going to hop over back to the mission control, the Neo4j desktop. And I'm going to use a tool which you all know and hopefully love, uh, which is the Neo4j browser. Now, the Neo4j browser has always been one of the key components of the Neo4j database. And it is the developer tool. So as the developer tool, I can see here what labels and relationship types I have. And I can write our cipher queries. So in this case, I'm going to write a cipher query here. Uh, that is just going to look at the transactions uh, or the first 50 transactions from account one to account two uh, and look at the amount of those transactions. And so we get these tabular results showing account one, account two, and then the amount of, of the value of the transaction, which is all good and dandy, but I needed to know Cypher for this. And now, all of you probably know Cypher, or many of you at least. Uh, the IT administrator who would do this loading from uh, the relational database over into Neo4j probably knows Cypher. The developer does as well. Um, but what if we're the fraud analyst? If we're trying to, to detect fraud and money laundering activity in the payment network, the fraud analyst might not know Cypher. Um, and while they could certainly learn Cypher, 
they might want a better way to do uh, their exploration of the graph. So with that, I'm gonna actually hop over to Acme Viz here, a visualization app that we built uh, to look at the payment network. Um, and I'm gonna start by searching, let's say we're interested in an account owned by Tom. I'm gonna search for Tom, um, and oh wait, it wasn't actually Tom, Tom must be a nickname. Uh, we have here an account, Tamika, and if I double click on this, uh, we can see Tamika is a person, um, and we can expand Tamika here, and we can see the account that Tamika owns. Um, and we can see here the account number there. Um, and if we look at this account and look at the uh, relationships from this account, we can see all of the transactions that are occurring in that account. Now, um, we see the transactions. Uh, if you look at the relationships here, these are all money transfer transactions. Um, and you can see money coming to uh, the account owned by Tamika as well as leaving from that account. And if we look at one of these particular places that Tamika is sending money to, we can expand that node as well. And we see uh, a person named Tomar is uh, who Tamika is sending money to. So this is great. As a fraud analyst, I can explore the network in a visual way. Uh, it is great for ad hoc exploration, discovery. But what if I wanna be a little bit smarter about this? What if I wanna provide the fraud analyst the power to speed up the discovery of fraud or money laundering in the network? So for that, uh, I'm gonna show you how we might apply graph algorithms or graph analytics in order to do that. So if we hop over here, I have this Acme Algo app, um, and I'll show you the queries it's executing. This Acme Algo app is really just executing a few simple cipher queries. The first one is union find. Uh, this is a clustering algorithm to determine the different communities in the graph. These are people that are transacting often with each other, sending money often to each other in smaller groups. I'm gonna add some labels so we can see what those communities look like. And then I'm going to also run a centrality score so we can see the important actors in the network, the people who a lot of these money transfers are going through. Now, I just wrote this simple application here to call these cipher functions. For those geeks in the crowd, I will show you what that looks like. Uh, we are actually just calling a couple procedures in the algorithms library. The first one here is calling the union fine procedure, passing in a virtual graph to that procedure, um, and then we're labeling the nodes and running the close to centrality algorithm here. Okay, so we've run these algorithms. Now let's jump back to the discovery and visualization tool or the discovery and visualization graph app and see how those algorithms have helped us speed up our results here. So instead of searching for Tom here, what I'm gonna do is search for account that sends money to account. And notice I'm not using Cypher here. Uh, it is looking at the labels and relationships in my database to do this. Um, and I'm gonna find all of the transactions in the database. So we see all of the transactions come in, all of the places where an account is sending money to another account. And uh, what you see up here in the top right are the different labels in the database here. And so we have cluster one through five. These are the community detection algorithm results uh, that are clustering the current transactions, the transactions that we are uh, of interest to us today. These are the transactions that have occurred recently. And we see laundering targets. These are the ones with high centrality scores, the ones that are 
kind of the information gateways in the network, or in this case, money gateways in the network. So now if we zoom in here, uh, we can actually see the different clusters. Um, in this cluster, we see, um, we see a couple different red nodes here, those laundering targets. Let me zoom in a little bit further. Uh, and we can see, actually, it's identifying the types of nodes we have here. Uh, the orange nodes here um, are in cluster two in their, their actual bank accounts. And then we have uh, our, our criminal, potential criminal, at least, right here. Now, uh, this was determined by that centrality algorithm to be uh, someone that really shares a lot of transactions with different groups in the network. And you can see how that works here. You can actually see just by dragging around this node um, how many people within the network or how many other connections and groups within the network uh, that this particular account is transacting with. So now let's look at this account. So we have uh, that account. We have a lot of these relationships incoming. We have a lot of money that is coming into this account. And we can also see that there's a lot of money going out to this account, uh, to one other account here. So let's look at each of these relationships. I'm going to double click them. And we can see the amount of the, the transaction, in this case, $9,526. Um, and if we look at each of these others, uh, we will actually notice $9,215, all right below the $10,000 US reporting limit. So we can see that this potential uh, laundering target has transacted, has sent a lot of money right below that limit. Um, and now if we look at who it is sending money to, or the account it's sending money to, and hit expand here to find information out about that account, well, it is sending all of its money to me. I'm excited. I'm going to be rich. Uh, this is fantastic. Only I also have a bunch of relationships going out. Why am I giving my money away? Uh, let's see here how much money I'm giving away. If I double click on this, uh-oh, I'm giving away almost $100,000 or 10x that reporting limit. And I have a number of those transactions. So it looks like I'm giving away all of my wealth. Uh, so we're going to see here who I'm giving that wealth to, and I'm giving it to Emil. It's going a little bit the wrong direction here. I work for Emil. He should be giving the money to me, not the other way around. But um, anyway, so we've investigated here and showed how a fraud analyst might use the power of the discovery and visualization tools, as well as the power of graph algorithms and graph analytics as part of the Neo4j graph platform in order to speed up the discovery of fraud and money laundering. Now, um, this is how the analyst doing the business every single day might use the graph platform. I'm going to show you one other graph app here, though. And this one other graph app here is a dashboard. It is a dashboard for the executives of the company, maybe like the chief risk officer of Acme Payment Network, to use to just keep an eye on the status of the network. So this is a custom-written application uh, using JavaScript in this case in order to understand more about the network. Payments that are occurring by cluster, outgoing payments over time, incoming payments over time, a lot of interesting data so that the executives can really see what the total amount of risk is with these potential laundering targets. Now, this isn't just any old application. This application is actually powered by a newer technology. It is powered by GraphQL. GraphQL is an alternative for building APIs. It's an alternative to REST, which is commonly used today. Um, and this application is built using what we call the grand stack or GraphQL, React, Apollo, and the Neo4j database. You can find out more information about the Grand Stack at grandstack.io. Uh, we see this as something that is really going to, to revolutionize the way that we build applications, powering 
uh, your graph-based applications with the GraphQL uh, framework. So 